to you, to you who have obtained similar precious faith because of the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through our knowledge of him who has called us through his glory. Amen. Signs. They have a tremendous impact on us every day. We see signs all around us, don't we? They're, they're there for various reasons. And, and I'd just like to point out perhaps three types of signs at the beginning of this message. The first type are informational signs. Informational signs. Some of those are advertising signs, such as in McDonald's or Apple or or whatever that uh, you, you see uh, being advertised to give you information so you'll buy their product. Others are signs in a, in a storefront perhaps saying help wanted, wanting people to have the information that someone's hiring. Or there are the blue and white symbol sign of a, of a hospital to let you know that you're near a hospital if that's what you need. Or if you're in a museum or a place and they don't want photography, there's a, an emblem sign that says, do not take flash pictures. Or there's a sign on the storefront that tells you what the hours are. Those are informational signs. There's also directional signs, such as your stop sign, or telling you where a scenic view is, or or maybe you come to a junction in the road and there's different highways you could take and it gives you directions on which way to go. Or of course there's exit signs such as the ones over our doors at the back in case we need to exit quickly. And then there's the one we all need from time to time very much and that's directions to the nearest restroom. Directional signs are good to have, right? Then there are warning signs such as swim at your own risk because there's no lifeguard there, or beware of the dog in somebody's yard, or danger explosives, or a sign that warns you not to break the law by loitering because there's a fine attached. Or maybe you go into a, a building and there's the uh, sign on the floor cautioning you that it's slippery and it, uh, be careful because it might be wet or icy. But there's another sign we want to look at today. And it's a crucial sign. It's an important sign. It's the sign that was placed above Jesus on the cross. And it's a sign that we kind of, when we read it in the scripture, we pass over it very quickly. We almost see it as an incidental detail of the story. It is far more than that. And so first we want to look at what is... What is the purpose of that sign? And I think we need to look at it, first of all, from Pilate's perspective, because he's the one who ordered it put there. It, sometimes I think we think that Pilate decided to do that in this case only. Actually, it was standard procedure for anyone being crucified. They would put the sign over the cross as a way of stating for which crime they were being crucified. It was to be a warning for those who would pass by not to be involved in those kind of things. And there were usually three reasons for a crucifixion according to the law of Rome. Now, a Roman citizen could not be crucified, but others could be. And, and the first reason was if you were a runaway slave or a slave who had stolen from their master, you could be crucified for that. So if that's what happened, the sign would say, runaway slave. If you were a pirate and you were caught, the sign would say, pirate. The third reason was the most common reason. If someone had committed treason against Rome, it would say, treason. Or give words that would explain the treason. And so Pilate had it written up, this is Jesus of Nazareth, according to John's gospel, this is Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. Because that's 
the reason he was being crucified. Now, something interesting is that that sign was usually carried in the procession where the criminal was being led out to the place of execution. It would be carried by a soldier leading the procession so that all could see the reason for which this person was being led to their death. And that probably happened with Jesus. Even though when you read the story, it doesn't mention the sign until they're there at, at Calvary. Because that's when they placed it on the cross. And so there's that long procession where this sign is being read. It's in three languages. It's in Aramaic, the language of the common people, the lang common language of the Jews. It's in Greek, the common language of culture. It's in Latin, the common language of the empire. It was in three languages so that everyone would know, would have no excuse for not knowing why this criminal is being executed and what they should avoid doing. There's another reason why Pilate had it written. It was his payback to the Jewish leaders. He knew they had manipulated the system. He knew that they had forced his hand, and though probably out of his own guilt, he put up that he was king of the Jews as a reminder to them of what they said was not true. It was kind of a sort of payback and revenge to the Jewish leaders. They would have to look at that sign knowing that they had placed him there. But I want to look at it from God's perspective. From God's perspective, it was taking a meaningless act of killing a traitor and giving it meaning of restoring humanity to himself. It, it, it was a hopeless act that would seem to be the end of this man who claimed to be the Messiah. But as Jesus was crucified, it became a hope-filled act. It was a reminder that while Caesar claimed to be sovereign of the empire, it is God who is the sovereign of the universe. And so this sign served as a reminder from God's perspective of everything he was trying to do, trying to accomplish for the salvation of mankind. But I think what we need to look at this morning a bit is the reactions of those who read the sign. The reactions of those who read the sign. I, I want you to notice, first of all, there there were the instigators, the religious leaders, the, the men who had a, a claim to being spiritual, but were far from it. I, I want you to notice, these were, these were men who worshipped in the Sabbath, who worshipped in the temple every day. These were men who were proud of their prayers. These were men who were tithe-paying, Sabbath-keeping leaders, who not only studied the Bible regularly to make sure they knew the truth, as they saw it, but also who wanted to uphold the traditions that they had instituted. And these instigators were in fact rejecting the Messiah. Then there were the indifferent and the insensitive. These are probably symbolized by, first of all, the unrepentant thief who ridiculed Jesus and said, if you can save, other, save yourself and us, please, because I don't want to die, but you take care of me. There was the, the cruel soldiers, their indifference and their insensitivity, putting the scarlet robe on him, the crown of thorns, ridiculing him, mocking him, saying, if you're the king of the Jews, come down. And then they would cast lots over his garments, leaving him naked on the cross. There was the fickle mob. The, the mob who many just the Sunday before had called out Hosanna to the son of David and are now crying out, crucify him, crucify him, because that just seemed to be the thing to do at the moment. That's what everybody else was doing. So the fickle mob was going along. 
there were those in the crowd who were curious. You see, the Romans would line the streets outside Jerusalem with crosses. The, the upright part was left in the ground. The, the criminal would only carry the cross beam to the crucifixion, and they would be hoisted up, and that cross beam would be put in place. And so the curious would be walking by wondering who was being crucified today. Perhaps asking a few questions why, but maybe not really seeking to know. And then there was the attentive. There was the repentant thief who saw Jesus, and Jesus was different than anyone else he'd ever seen. Jesus wasn't there crying out and, and crying out for his own needs. He was there taking care of others' needs as he was dying slowly from the crucifixion that was taking place, but from which he would not die because he wouldn't die from the cross. He would die because he was forsaken by God in your place and in mine. There is the good soldier. He was attentive. He was watching everything. He had never seen a crucifixion in which the man appeared so innocent, so different, so unexplainably righteous, so unexplainably having a divine quality. Help but explain, after it was all over, truly this was the Son of God. And then there were the faithful followers, Mary, his mother, John, the beloved disciple, the other women. And Luke tells us, and we often overlook this, Luke tells us there was also a great multitude of followers who were also there at the cross, riveted, watching, praying for his deliverance. I want you to notice that the people who were there reacted to that sign and to the cross in different ways. But there is a meaning of the cross for you and for me. The sign read, Jesus of Nazareth. The name Jesus mean the, means the Lord is salvation. It reminds us that he provides salvation and we cannot save ourselves. He's from Nazareth, a common town. He didn't come in splendor and glory to, to amaze people. He came to serve and to seek and to save the lost. And he came, not as a king, but he came to die on a cross so that one day he would be the king, the sovereign not just of the Jews, but the sovereign of the universe. But there's another meaning of the sign for us. It's not told in the Gospels. It's told in Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 to 14. And I want to read it from, first of all, the New International Version, the original International Version in 1984. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. This text has often been used by people to say that the law of Moses, both moral law and, and ceremonial law, were done away with because it was nailed to the cross. The Ten Commandments are no longer valid for the Christian. We simply are motivated by love. There is some truth in that last aspect, but not entirely. And so as Adventists, we have looked at that and we said, no, it's only the ceremonial law. But I want to point out something that is in the Andrews Study Bible, on a footnote to Colossians 2, verses 12 to 14. The picturesque language may describe a certificate of debt owed, or a promissory note that lists the debt owed for our sins, an obligation canceled by Christ on his cross. You see, 
When it says he canceled the written code, that's not the word for the law, either ceremonial or moral. It was the word that was used in the marketplace, in, in business, for a canceled debt. A debt that had been wiped out. A debt that was owed, I'm, I'm sorry. And then later when it says that he, he uh, that was against us and he took it away, that was the word for being wiped out, erased. You see, what, what's on the sign above Jesus' head, remember, was he was dying because of the crime of treason. And if we look at it honestly, when we sin against the sovereign of the universe, we have committed treason against the sovereign of the universe. He took the death that we deserved, that we might have the righteousness that we do not deserve. I, I want to read it in a more modern translation. It's called the Passion Translation. It's really more of a paraphrase. Because it really puts it in a way that I believe explains what Paul was writing about there. He says, he, Jesus, canceled out every legal violation we had on our record and the old arrest warrant that stood to indict us. He erased it all, our sins, our stained soul. He deleted it all, and they cannot be retrieved. Everything we once were in Adam has been placed onto his cross and nailed permanently there as a display, as a public display of cancellation. The English Standard Version Study Bible, I think, explains what was taking place there the best. The record of debt was a written note of indebtedness. Paul uses this as a word picture to characterize each person's indebtedness to God because of sin. God himself has mercifully resolved this problem for all who put their faith in Jesus by taking this note and nailing it to the cross where Jesus paid the debt. The image comes from the notice fastened to a cross by the Roman authorities declaring the crime for which the criminal was being executed. So there is a sense in which the Ten Commandments are there revealing our sin and our need of a Savior. And Jesus paying that penalty for us. And it is our debt that is nailed to the cross. Canceled by the blood of of our Savior. So, the question now becomes, as we look at this communion service today, as we're reminded of the death of Jesus, the question becomes, what will be your response to the sign on the cross this morning? Will you be like the religious leaders, the instigators of his death, Will you be among those who are trusting in the form of godliness but denying the power thereof? Sabbath keeping, tithe paying, Bible study, but not really recognizing God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit for who they are. More interested in keeping the traditions than becoming like him. Will you be among the indifferent, those who simply want to get something from God to make their life on earth just a little bit better. Like the soldiers who cast lots for his cloak. Or the unrepentant thief who just simply wanted to keep his life in the here and now. Will you be among the fickle mob going along with whatever religious trend comes up at the moment? Trying to fit in and belong and to, to be like everyone else? Or will you be among the curious, looking to see what's in it for me? I believe in Christian circles today, there's much of what is Christian consumerism, coming to church simply to get out of it what makes you feel good, rather than getting out of it what makes God ple uh, pleased with you. Will you be among the attentive, are you among the attempt of seeking what is it that God has for me? Who is this God? What is he like? How can I have a deeper walk with him? Well, you, are you among the faithful followers? But there is a difference between the faithful followers at the cross and those of us who are faithful followers now. At the cross, they were crushed by what was taking place. 
At the cross, they are, were uncertain as to what the meaning of what was going on had for them. At the cross, they felt hopeless. At the cross, they felt despair. But for those who are faithful followers of Jesus, who know that that cross was there as the only means of salvation, as the only means of becoming transformed, as the only means of knowing God, whom to know is life eternal. As faithful followers today, we can celebrate with joy at the foot of the cross. Today, we can celebrate what God can do that we cannot do ourselves. Today, we can celebrate the gift of all gifts, the gift of eternal life, the gift of restoration to God, the gift of becoming the person he created us to be, that we might reflect his love and his mercy and his grace to those around us. In a few moments, you will be dismissed. And we will take place in, in something that is a bit unusual for some people. We call it the ordinance of humility. I, I tend to call it the symbol of cleansing and humble service. For it is a reminder that we periodically need to be cleansed from sin. And we need to be willing to serve each other. It's, we call it foot washing. Today, the women who choose to be in a group of just women will be in the adult Sabbath school room over this way. Uh, families will be in the fellowship hall. And men will be in the community services room. If you choose to stay here, music will be played. I encourage you, don't leave. Don't leave because you think you're not good enough. I would remind you that what makes you good enough the sign above Jesus' head reminds us that's what makes us good enough. Period. Don't leave because it's going to take a little bit longer than usual. Stay by because I believe the Holy Spirit is here in a way that he's at no other service because it reminds us of how valued we are by the God who sent his son to die for us. How valued we are by the son who came and gave up his life for us. And how valued you are by the spirit who dwells within you. Stay. Celebrate. Enjoy your time reflecting on the sacrifice of Jesus. The sacrifice that makes it possible for you and I to be sons and daughters of the sovereign of the universe who loves us so much that he can't stand thinking about eternity without us. At this time, we'll separate. We'll come back and celebrate the Lord's Supper together as we think and contemplate on the greatest gift that has ever been given. <laughs>